to welcome everybody to another Kingdom Pollen ending stage. Hopefully you are all enjoying this uh, increasingly more complex video series um, as we started out with the basic Kingdom Pollen ending ideas that everyone needs to understand, not just to play Kingdom Pollen endings and uh, evaluate the more complex ones that we're getting to, but also to play other end games, you know, evaluating every, every trade, any sort of transition or evolution of a position that you're in a healthy and solid knowledge of King of Pawn endings can really increase your ability to uh, to evaluate accurately when you're calculating things, if you have a better idea of what's coming. So that's the purpose of our series here, continuing to master King of Pawn endings and improve our knowledge, and uh, welcome once again. So here we're looking at a position um, that is very tricky, uh, one of my favorite uh, positions in regards to the more advanced king upon ending ideas, whether we call it irregular opposition, corresponding squares, some some distant opposition, although right now the kings are, are pretty close. At some point here you'll see they start to separate. Uh, but like we did in stage three, I believe, where we did more problem solving, I really would suggest that um, everyone take a moment if they want to evaluate this position. It is white to play here. Obviously, I don't need to tell you you're trying to win, um, because if you wanted to draw, you could just agree to it right now. You're up a pawn, right? Let's, let's all take that in for a second. So you're up a pawn, so what you're trying to do is try to win. And I, I would really um, urge you to, to pause, and I want to give some, another, some further reasons for that. It's not just because your, uh, your ability to, to really soak in this information and for it to really become a part of your application, because there's always a transition from learning things to actually being able to apply it, is oftentimes based on how hard you apply yourself during studying and, and during, during the practice in your own time, right? That practice makes perfect phrases. is kind of misleading unless you treat your practice like it matters. So please pause your video. Take a moment to evaluate this endgame and uh, tell me what you think. Okay, so uh, hopefully you pause your video and you're back. This is... Uh, a very tricky position. White's ability to make progress on the king's side is sort of stunted right now based on the fact that he really doesn't have very much space, right? When you're dealing with a corner pawn and the, uh, the two files here, as far as the uh, knight and the rook file, you have limited maneuvering space. We'll say that. So White, White can try to, to, to beat his head against a brick wall as long as he needs to, right? A lot of players enjoy that, right? Just beating your head against a brick wall. White can do that, um, but even, even pushing the pawn is not going to do anything. There's no, there's no triangulation here. There's no sort of opposition tricks. Eventually, you may just push the pawn forward and find that you're not going anywhere. So calculating, calculating variations where you're, where you're beating your head against the H-file brick wall is, is not going to get you anywhere. So hopefully, you, you've applied some of the knowledge in the end games that we've already done previously, and you understand that white may have the ability to remaneuver the king and perhaps head, head via, via the center or queen side, I guess that direction, over, over around to the F1. Now, it's very tricky because any sort of obvious transfer of the king allows, allows the enemy king to be active. Right? We play some sort of simple moves. Let's go with the most direct line. Black actually has the ability to come to G5 rather than H4. Right? If you calculate a variations where he simply ignorantly goes after your H1, he's going to lose. But Hopefully, some of you kept in mind the king dance position, which I believe we did in, either, in stage two, which is really that beginning position, as I said, a middle ground position trying to show you the beginning concepts of corresponding squares. And the corresponding squares here being e4 and g5, if white ever goes to e4 and black is able to go to g5, uh, white cannot win this anymore. Obviously, if you continue to move forward, you're going to lose this pawn, and even a sacrifice of the h-pawn doesn't do anything in fact because black will not be dumb enough to take g5, giving you Zugzwang in the irregular opposition. He'll make a waiting move, forcing you to take the square you don't want to, and now he'll win the pawn. I guess white's last chance would be to realize that he had blundered and come back, and uh, ironically, because his position was so good to start, he can actually lose the pawn, but still draw the end game by achieving standard defensive opposition. So... Uh, a simple maneuver or, or trying to transfer your king over is not going to work. You have to figure out the right timing, find perhaps some sort of way to use the H-pawn as a decoy so that you can achieve your goal of eventually coming around. How does white do that? Well, it's awfully fun and uh, super exciting to see. Okay, silly rabbit, tricks are for kids. We're about to be little kids here and see some cool tricks. All right, here we go. After king H4, king to G7, you're playing king H4 not to beat your head against the brick wall, but actually to improve your position via triangulation. The king goes to g3. 
And after the king comes back to h6, you head back to g4. Well, boys and girls, we have the same position we started with, but what's the difference? It is now black to move, okay? So real quick, we see that again. We see the reason why we call this a triangulation is because we are uh, forming a shape of a triangle when we draw arrows between these three squares. Now we're in the same position in black must retreat. So black moves his king back to either one of these squares. It doesn't really matter because you can't gain opposition by coming forward. So he moves to one of these squares. Now, what was the purpose here of this idea? We can now start to come over without worrying about his king coming up directly. There are actually two moves that win here. Both king f4 and king f3 win. But king f3 is perhaps the most logical to prove the point of corresponding squares. The idea is, is very specific. You have only one move here that wins. You can repeat the position. You can also make some silly moves like king g3 and let him come up. Or you can do the move, as I first said, that was a mistake, which would allow him to come forward. But there is one move that actually makes progress here, and it's a recognition of the corresponding squares. We're going to talk about how you can do this in your games in a second. The move is king to e3, double exclam of biatch. The idea is pretty simple. If he goes to g5, I want to go to e4 when it's his move. I don't want my king on e4 and king on g5 with my move. So recognizing that those two squares are critical, knowing that I need to go to e4 only after he's gone to g5. So that if I go to e4, he'll have to move, and then I can make progress, right? So by going king to e3, black plays king to h5, avoiding the square, because he's a smart cookie. And we continue to make progress, avoiding the critical square. King to d4, another exclaim of Yash. What's just happened here? We started out with a triangulation, and then avoided the critical squares, but still made progress toward the, toward the, uh, the f-pawn. Black's best move now is to come back to g5 forcing us to take the square that we could have gone to for the last few moves, but only doing so when the timing was right. The king must now move. He can go after the h-pawn if he wants. He can do whatever he wants, in fact, when winning the endgame. So when you look at this trick here, this is, this is a very common... Triangulation is not just a way to make progress moving forward aggressively. Triangulation can be a way to lose time yourself, right? You're achieving the same position you already currently have, except your opponent is, is, is with, with the turn to move, not yourself. As I said, the three, uh, the three daddies of, of king and pawn endings, I said the three most advanced concepts are triangulation, flanking, and corresponding squares, which corresponding squares is kind of all, everything at once. You're kind of always calculating corresponding squares, which is simply a recognition like, okay, if my opponent goes there, I need to go to that square. So doing it at a basic level, you're already doing that concept. But as the positions become more complicated, it becomes harder to dictate or at least calculate the corresponding squares. So how do you do that here? Well, the first set of corresponding squares usually it comes from a goal. You can't really know where you're headed unless you have a goal. So if you do recognize that you're not going to achieve anything here, hopefully before you've pushed this pawn and blown your win, but if you do recognize that you're not going to achieve anything here, and you recognize your goal of coming around, you already see that these two are corresponding squares because of your knowledge of king of pawn innings. You know that when you go there, he's going to go there. Right? Or, or vice versa. Whoever, one player is going to go there first. Those are corresponding squares. And depending on whose move it is will be critical. Right? So first you're recognizing it's the squares. Whether you can dictate whose move it is or not, we'll, we'll, you'll have to calculate that. But you have to recognize the goal. Those two, those two squares are corresponding. Then you see that in order to make progress, you also have to avoid this square until after he's taken, until after he's taken the G5 square himself. Because otherwise, he gets it with your move. So you start calculating things, but it's easy to backtrack when you have a goal, right? So you keep avoiding the critical squares because you know what you're trying to do. You wouldn't be able to find uh, tricky moves like this unless you knew your goal, first of all. And you also wouldn't understand that you needed to avoid certain squares along the way unless you understood corresponding squares. So it is tricky, and you can watch this a few times, and hopefully um, I didn't talk too fast or, or go over everybody's head, but I think, uh, there are, I think watching these videos step by step, you're sort of building your muscles, and everyone should be able to stay with this. So we're going to set up another one here, another advanced one that I would like you to try to solve. Okay? And, uh, and this, this is another advanced one. This one is more of a uh, defensive 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 uh, advanced opposition idea, but another position I would like you to s try to solve. Uh, okay, this position is white to play. You can go ahead and pause your videos. Okay, and uh, hope you're back. So, uh, this is a tricky position. The kings are on, you know, several squares distant from each other. We have this typical three-square distance. 
uh, calculating obvious moves with the king, you see that your opponents, your opponent will come forward and start munching your pawns, obviously, before your king can reach defensive, defensive uh, squares. But many people might calculate, oh, well, I can make a waiting move and get opposition. Because just by maintaining the distant opposition, even if he munches, we're still drawing this position. Unfortunately, with your pawn, with your enemy pawn not having moved yet, he can simply make a waiting move of his own, and he's right back, uh, right back in candy land where he's happy. Right now, he's just won the opposition, and the, and the pawn will go marching on. So coming forward and getting, even if you maintain the distant opposition with a, with a strong move like king to g1, it doesn't make a difference when your opponent has a potential waiting move. If the structure was irrelevant and your opponent did not have a waiting move, white already has distant opposition in this situation. So White's drawing method is actually a very strong move, g6, exclam of Yash. You sacrifice the enemy pawn. He can capture two ways. King takes is pretty obviously why we're pretty um, it's pretty obvious for us to see why that's a draw. He's losing time and our king can come up and draw. However, taking with the pawn is a little bit trickier because He's still threatening to make progress, and we're still in a situation where making a waiting move and gaining distant opposition is irrelevant to our cause. He has a waiting move. So sacrificing one pawn is not sufficient. We must sacrifice another, exclaim of Yach once again. You actually have baited this pawn to a less, a less happy square, um, a le uh, just a square that eliminates the idea of, of making a waiting move. So now... The fact that you have maintained distant opposition, you're simply going to go back and forth, back and forth, and uh, eventually he will come forward and give you that opposition, and we have no longer, black no longer has the ability to make a waiting move. By pushing the pawn forward equal to the king, we know we're in a drawn endgame. You start to see that your ability to figure out tricky positions like this is basically dead in the water if you haven't watched the first few videos and haven't made an effort to really commit those concepts and those patterns to memory. Because if you don't know, like I know by heart, that if my opponent's pawn is equal to or in front of the king, I know that this is a draw. I just know it. I don't need to calculate it. When, if, he, if he has to push his pawn forward, this position is an easy draw. The basic concept, we simply come straight back from the pawn, waiting to get opposition on either entry by the king. Either entry by the king, we gain opposition, and the position always leads to a forced stalemate.